We really appreciate you joining here at Inspiration Summit Barcelona. This is our second uh, Inspiration Summit. This is a forum where we will have uh, some provocative dialogue around the transformative uh, elements of what's going on and some of the massive disruption uh, that we speak about in our industry. Krishna, let's start with you. Um, so you work for uh, the kind of the European arm of Draper, Fisher Turbotson. Tell us a bit about you, because I think the interesting thing is with you is that, that you have kind of invested in several different companies. I started off investing quite a lot in uh, comms, networking companies, uh, equipment companies, service provider companies, uh, independent service providers, obviously. Uh, as the tech investing environment evolved, Obviously, I evolved and we started then looking at businesses which had more capital efficient uh, business models, which principally tended to be software companies or, or internet companies. And that's where most of my new investments have been over the last, let's say, five years. So where, I mean, we're supposed to, at least in, in, in this first panel, to talk about the, the big trends you see. I mean, yeah, the... if, I, if I take a step back, I think what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is you know, a, a massive uh, change in, you know, underlying compute power. And that's really the thing that's enabled, you know, the emergence of mobile as a, you know, uh, as a massive opportunity for startups, for uh, corporates, and clearly for service providers. Bernardo, uh, you are a man of many hats. So you, you're an entrepreneur. You founded a social networking company, I think, in Spain. A couple of them, yeah. But now you work for Google. You're the CEO mm -hmm. of uh, Zagat. Zagat, yeah. Uh, so you're a manager, but also you're also an investor. Yeah, uh, yeah. you invest in Spain of all places. Uh, uh, yes, Spain is a great country. It's, it was the eighth economy in the world. Now we're the tenth, <laughs> but it's still an amazing country with beautiful infrastructure, as you can see. Um, t tell tell me again. Also, the question to you. So so so, what keeps you up at night? At night. So um, I think the future is totally unpredictable. We're talking about trends in technology, but. I will identify to answer your question um, three tra three trends. As for me, I think are going to be key. You know? One one it's in one it's in hardware. Uh, we just heard that you you know that like you know money it's going still to software because it's easy to get returns and it's easy. But like um, if you look back, um, you know there was the cover page of the Economist a couple of weeks ago how 120 years ago innovation happened you know, hardware because there was no software, very little support. And it was amazingly disruptive. And here we are, you know, iterating over and over again over almost the same, you know, few things over software. I think the bigger challenge right now is how to push hardware to actually embrace the huge development in software to create, you know, amazing innovation. You know, offline problems like moving people and goods. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure like it will be a catalyst for developing an amazing business model and amazing wealth. So, um, hardware and solving real problems for real people in the real world, um, I think those two things uh, keep me up at night. And then, uh, in mobile, not so much the mobile services, but mobile monetization. Dan, you you kind of different here on, on this panel. You're a corporate VC. You're head of corporate venturing at Verizon. How is that different from what what these guys do? Our older mission was, it was very obvious what the difference was. We would only invest in companies that could lead to a direct commercial relationship with a Verizon business unit. Um, and so consequently, it was uh, later stage opportunities where there was already a, a view on how they would be working with Verizon. And, and uh, when you do that, you have, you can take risk out of the investment side of it because you have visibility in what's going in in the business model for that company. Uh, and then we found that by making those investments, we actually improve the relationship between the startup and the Verizon business unit. But we've actually started to change our charter to get further out ahead of the uh, of the business units. And so we're now looking at at investments that will kind of create value for our customers and or enhance our services or networks. Why this kind of this shift from from investing in stuff that is kind of very close to your heart to something which is further out? What's well, I think it's a it's a recognition that we want to help. Uh, drive innovation more quickly at, at Verizon and um, you know we're Verizon as a company uh, over the past 10 years has made more uh, capex investment than any other company in the world if you count what we buy for spectrum the capital that we put in the ground and acquisitions we spent more money than anyone else so when you've got that sort of investment 
you know, it's you need to get a higher yield or return investment, you got to bring in new services mm. to be able to do that. And so, venturing is one small piece that uh, can help, but it's also trying to get further ahead of where the business units are looking right now, so that we can help improve their intelligence, their um, their visibility on new technology, new companies, new business yeah. models. This year, I think uh, the themes that we think are important are micro location or indoor location um, uh, needs to improve so that uh, you can take you know the great advances that have happened with turn by turn and navigation and mapping and and get it in, into a, a, a in, inside the building inside campuses so uh, you can direct someone from you know just on the street and then get them in. Um, mobile ad tech still needs a lot of uh, improvement. You see, if you look at um, at uh, the mobile, at uh, the web advertising companies, um, you know, beyond just uh, ad networks, there needs to be all these other kind of um, uh, service providers within within um, advertising that haven't been created yet on the mobile side. So, again, it's it's uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity for making investments in that space. Um, I think HTML5. Uh, is pretty. It's probably a little late for us to be us to be making investments. I'm still watching that because I think the tools that HTML5 can do can really unlock um, uh, the closed kind of ecosystems of the app the app stores have right now. And if you blow those open, I think it makes it easier for companies to um, get direct to consumers or to work with carriers to get to get to market. So I think there's a good opportunity there. And machine to machine is still, um, I think, a, a a challenge to find opportunities that can kind of really go horizontal. I think there's a lot of great vertical opportunities, um, but they tend to be small companies, and I, I think they're they're providing really great solutions to customer to their customers, but they end up being funny little companies, and and so I think that makes them um, uh, makes it tough for them to raise capital from VCs because they're they're just get to be too small. So I think there's an opportunity for a strategic to do kind of lubrication of that market by doing investments in that space. When you see kind of these big trends, we call them big data or cloud computing, all that, is is there kind of a general theme how that disrupts business model? The people that are best positioned to create the disruption is the, is normally the ones that actually screw it up the most. And I, I keep seeing that like over and over again, like in media, how like, you know, traditional newspapers and, you know, they were like beautifully positioned to, to manage that transition and embrace the new technology and just, you know, you know, protect that source of revenue. And then, you know, they were like, you know, um, 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 totally lost and then newcomers, you know, came and, and, and did that. And, you know, that tendency to, to be blind to the disruption from a position of uh, of strength, uh, it, it's it's it might you know I think it's contagious and it goes to the VC side too. And I see a lot of big traditional VCs, you know, also corporate VCs, were like, you know, you know, they don't see that and they 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 block themselves from betting, from taking truly a risk. I, I would be cautious about that tendency to be blind to true disruption. To come from not only the industrial side but also go into the into the VC the VC side. Another kind of uh, it's not so much a theme, but it's my definite belief that for every web service or website that you see right now uh, that are, that's popular, there will be a mobile pure play that will come up and be and take significant share away from it. Now they may end up getting acquired by the incumbent there, but that displacement that happened from old line media to and more than just old line media, but but older services to the web, there's going to be a mobile pure play. Same thing that's going to take that the the web the web guys are going to be too slow to respond to because they're they built their technology base and their focus on the customer on that on that uh, computer screen and think instead of thinking it as a as a mobile device. And, and so I'm always on my eye for that. And I think it's a challenge to say, hey, is this strategic or not for us as investors? But uh, uh, you know, as part of my job is convincing people that it should be. Sure. And I, I agree with Bernardo. You know, the the challenge of the challenge for many uh, established players is one of cannibalization, right? You know, do you cannibalize your existing revenue stream, your customer base, your service proposition, or you know, and and take that step and innovate, or do you actually wait until a, a young upstart forces you into doing it? I mean, if you look at the telecoms industry, how would you say have carriers fared so far? I mean, how did they react? You know, when when I started in, in investing in startups 15, 16 years ago. 
the uh, mindset that I came across amongst the carrier community was the importance of owning the billing relationship. That was that was preeminent in their minds. If they control the billing relationship, then that was the way to maintain, protect their business model, their revenue stream, their profitability. Uh, in my mind, that's no longer really the case, frankly. I think consumers look at the billing relationship with their carrier, the service provider, really as any other utility. And what they value more is the functionality or the application or the specific piece of, uh, let's call it, uh, interaction they get through their device or through their uh, uh, subscription from the from the carrier. My question to the carrier community would be, you know, have they actually embraced that and reacted to that in a way that allows them to capture the opportunity that technology uh, is potentially presenting to them? What do you think, on, on a scale from 1 to 10, how, how have carriers reacted so far? And what needs to happen? If you think about it, again, they could have done a beautiful thing. And remember, like back in 99, when 3G was ready, and the handsets were not ready, but they were like trying to develop handsets. You like you, you said it. And for five, seven years, we're all in the hands of the carriers, waiting for the carriers to make it happen. And we were waiting. And then, you know, like, oh, no, we're going to try to we learn from the experience on the web when we provided the pipelines of the corporate lines and the internet, but then the internet was so free that it just exploded beyond our control and it was impossible for us to monetize. On mobile, we are going to learn from that. And no. 2005, remember those Nokias where you have to like move with the cursor, like, you know, impossible to click? <laughs> And then, um, and then, you know, and, and then the iPhone happened and like, you know, pushing the carrier, like, you know, um, the first carrier to the point where like, you, we had, you know, you know, unlimited data. What are you talking about? Unlimited data. That's our source of revenue. And, uh, you know, it's again a great example of how the incumbent could have done the transition. They tried really hard for like six, seven years and it just, it just didn't happen because they were trying to, you know, own, own, uh, own the user. And, and it, they know we all know what the problem is. It's like they don't want to get disintermediated. They don't want to. They don't want to lose that amazing first-hand experience with the user. They're like they're, they know them. They, they build them, and it happened on the web when they just became a backend provider of a utility called the internet, and then every other service created on top of that was monetized by someone else. After thinking about this for a long time, I think it comes to a problem of talent and getting it. You know, it's really hard to innovate when you don't get it. It's um, hard to innovate when you don't get it. Two to three or three to four, do you think that's fair? <laughs> no, well, no. I, I mean, I think we were clearly on the front end of creating innovation and bringing the network capability, and we still are in terms of bringing network capability. I mean, people love 4G, LTE networks. They love having that capacity. No startup's going to be able to do that. And there's, just, there's just no way. Absolutely. And, 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 and that's innovation to bring, bring it. And same thing with our Fios network to customers. They love having, uh, you know, big fat pipes to bring, bring home with great services and the best quality video you can get to them. So the, we do drive innovation. Now, in fairness, though, I think uh, at the same time when, when the iPhone came out, that, disrupt, that was disruptive. But I would argue that Apple didn't see it coming either, the way the disruption happened. They brought great, a, a great user experience, but I think they were expecting that it was going to be people going to interact to, to a browser. They, the way the application environment took off, um, uh, I think, was a pleasant surprise for them because they certainly did, weren't ready to, to, you know, focus on that when initial, when the iPhone came out, and that that did cause disruption back to us. I think, you know, where it's the it's not so much a question of talent um, is um, it's a question of. That, you know, being able to iterate more quickly at a startup than than the carrier can because they can they can put substandard product out there that solves part of the problem, attracts some customers, is not a perfect service. They can in, they can innovate faster. Where you know you have a quality brand that's associated with 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 uh, you know virtually perfect delivery of services, doing something iterative that doesn't quite all work is 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 a challenge but I, I i think your concern is how do you monetize all that and every time that you know a, a new business model is built on that on that amazing you know uh, backbone of uh, access of data you're like you know why don't we monetize this beyond just charging for access but how don't we like you know take a piece of all those business models that like you know to allow people to watch more tv you know more more movies 
let's get a piece of that. Buy more um, uh, uh, goods and services, like you know, let's get a piece of that. And it's it's that connection between not not being limited to charge for the access, but also participate on the business models that are built on that access, uh, which I think is a challenge for you guys. Believe me, for 20 years people have been saying, don't turn the networks into a dump pipe. So, I mean, and yeah. for every every time the networks run, the have evolved, it's been saying that. And it's still a challenge for us to make sure that we're providing, uh, you know, a, uh, not just a platform, but a, ca a capability that works with startups to be able to share in that stuff. But at the same time, there's going to be, um, um, we, we got to be providing value to that startup in a way that uh, makes them willing to share. Yeah. Uh, and I think when it comes to those platforms, you need to do that from a perspective of like, openness free you know freedom and fast you know when you when you approach when you do an, a platform you read an, an api or a platform just to lock the user in like you know to to stop the user of the developer to go away it, it's it's a, it's a hard perspective to do that from like you know developers and users they on the internet in general they love openness and freedom and fast so like you know if you i think monetizing you know uh, the access or the, or the platform itself, um, I th I don't think it's necessarily the right approach. I think it's much better to use a platform used by hundreds of millions of people and then think of ways of building other platforms and then you don't want to share because, you know, that's what money, another kind of money is mm. on top of that without mixing. I, I think that there will be certain types of companies, certain types of business models which can be or are highly capital efficient where Frankly, you probably don't necessarily need a VC because you can build it quickly, get it to a point, and and those companies inherently have a certain, in my opinion, uh, maximum value they can achieve. And and I think the the challenge for us is not just sources of capital that's available for entrepreneurs; it's actually understanding how uh, efficient it has become to create businesses and tailoring our model and understanding that. You know, actually, the VC business model has to move away from just looking for the the hundred x. You know, everything you know, investing in just home runs, and figure, figuring out how you blend home run investing with backing smart young entrepreneurs who actually need that experience. Because eventually, on there, maybe the third company is going to be a home run, but the first one may not be a home run, maybe a small one. The second one may be a failure. That's okay. You know, embracing that. 